Okay, well, we're glad that those of you who couldn't join us last Sunday or can join us today via the internet and the, uh, the virtual dimension, as I like to call it. The, uh, I'm in a teaching ministry here at Living Springs, and today we're going to continue our um, teaching series through the book of Galatians. Galatians. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, and um, so you want to open your Bibles there with us? That's our text today, and you'll need to have that to read it along with us in your Bibles. And um, we'll put the, you know, I'll, I'll take care of the other ones, okay, <laughs> the other text. So anyway, okay, Galatians chapter 3, and we want to continue today and open this teaching with a uh, introductory verse, as we often do, that really sets the stage for where we're going today. And today's introductory verse, um, we covered about a week or two ago, and uh, it really does lay the foundation for going on today. And it's Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. The law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. Now, as you recall from our previous studies, God made a promise to Abraham, a, prom a promise which God personally confirmed. <laughs> conformed. He confirmed it, okay, uh, as a covenant, a covenant which God bound himself through a promised seed to bring to pass in the eternal perfection of his time and way. And Abraham, in turn, responded to God. Genesis 15, verse 6, testifies that he simply believed God. And God accounted that to him for righteousness. And by righteousness, it means then that God and Abraham were able to walk together in a right relationship toward the realization of that promise. In other words... It was simply by faith that Abraham walked in right relationship with God, rather than apart from him or, or in opposition to God. He was totally focused on the seed who would come forth in the fullness of God's appointed time and then bring the promise to pass. And that seed, well, you see it there in your Bibles, Galatians 3.16, it said, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, referring to God, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, it says, and to your seed, one who is Christ. See, faith is the only way, really, that anyone's ever going to truly know, love, and walk with God. And we're not just talking Abraham. Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 9, tells us that by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. So he receives this promise from God, and by faith he receives and embraces it, and then he just, he goes with it. He lives for it. But he wasn't the only one. It says, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Isaac was his son. Jacob was the grandson. The heirs with him of the same promise. So they were all living for the same thing. They were all living for the same promise, and they were walking with God by faith. And in fact, really, there were many women and men of faith throughout the Old Testament who, who stood out and apart from their contemporaries as those who truly believed and walked with God. Their hearts and lives totally focused on the promise. As Hebrews 11 verses 39 and 40 concludes, it says, and, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Us, well, that's referring to all those whom God spoke to Abraham about back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, when if you recall, he, God, brought him, Abraham, outside and said, look now toward the heaven and count the stars, if you're able to number them, which it's impossible. And he said to him, the Lord said to Abraham, 
so shall your descendants be as the stars of heaven. Talking about a people redeemed and reconciled unto God out from among all the nations and the peoples of the world as a result of that better thing. Something even better than the covenant that God made with Abraham when God alone that night passed, walked between the pieces of the sacrifice confirming the covenant for Abraham. And that promised one, the better thing, well, it's the promised seed who has now come, who died to atone for our sins and was resurrected from the dead, thereby securing our eternal inheritance in himself, providing you and I an even better guarantee of our glorious destiny as fellow heirs with Jesus so that we can totally now love, look, and live for it, even in this life. And I'm talking about the seal of his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God now who's been given to live within all who respond to the gospel by turning from themselves and all else to focus their faith, their lives, their destiny instead in Jesus, just Jesus. And I pray that's all of you. I mean, it does. It sounds really like the perfect plan, doesn't it? Simple faith in a faithful God who has and will always be forever faithful to his promise. A promised life and destiny, the likes of which 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 describes as, listen to this, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not pass away. I love this part. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And all you got to do is take God in his word and believe. Throwing aside forever what 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15 through 16 describes as the world and the things of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Focusing your faith, your heart, your hope, and your life on loving, looking, and living for God's promise instead. that has been secured through Jesus Christ. Thereby, joining our blessed counterparts of the faith in the Old Testament regarding whom we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, again, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And if truly they'd call to mind that country from which they'd come out of, or like the world, they would have had opportunity to return. And the same for you and I. We, we could go back into the world if we want to, but it's like, why would you want to? It goes on to state, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Yeah, that's our company. We're a part of that now through faith in Christ. You know, it does remind me of what Jesus himself promised in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where he told us, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But the thing is, and we talked about this last week, this promise, it's not something that any of us can work for. Jesus alone already secured it for us through his miraculous incarnation, his sinless life, selfless suffering, atoning death, and victorious resurrection. So, if we can't work to earn it, well, rather it's something that we through faith can receive. And therefore really ought to be living for every day. 
if that is, we truly believe. I mean, seriously, it couldn't get any better than that. Simply responding to the gospel of God's promise in Jesus Christ in simple, life-changing faith. Well, so why was it then that the law, all those rules, regulations, and requirements, in other words, works, why was the law then, 435 years after the promise was given, why was the law imposed upon the nation of Israel, the lineal descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob? I'm talking about, yes, the Old Testament nation of Israel. Again, 435 years later after God confirmed his promise to Abraham and his descendants to inherit by faith. Question, why? Why? Why, why? why did we need the law? You know, oftentimes we look at things that are new. You have this and then it's succeeded by something else that comes a little bit later and it's like, well, that's old. This is new. New's got to be better, right? <laughs> new and improved? Eh, not in this case. Okay, well, so why didn't God's covenant work? Why didn't God's covenant of faith work when it came to Israel? Old Testament Israel, the chosen lineage of Abraham through which the promised seed had been eternally predetermined to come forth. Well, the Old Testament nation of Israel, the answer to that is easy. How did Abraham receive the promise? How did Isaac receive the promise? How did Jacob receive the promise and walk in faith and right relationship with God toward the realization of that promise that was afar off? They believed, right? Well, that was the problem with Old Testament Israel. They didn't believe. So get a load of the warning that's given in Hebrews chapter 3. To many of the, what's given to many of the Jewish believers in Christ back in the days when the New Testament was recorded for our admonition. It tells them and it references their fathers in the wilderness. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 7 through 11. And since it's recorded in the scripture, I think it's something that we, it's an admonition that the rest of us need to also take to heart. Where the Holy Spirit says, therefore, today, if you will hear his voice, the voice of the Lord, the word of God, and you're hearing it right now, the word of God, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years, including man being delivered through the Red Sea, man, the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> Therefore, God said, I was angry with that generation. And, they, and I said, they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So the Lord said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And a whole generation of them, literally more than a million of them, perished in the wilderness. You see, that word rest refers to laying aside reliance on one's own works to obtain the promise, which God promised that he himself would bring about. Warning the rest of us, therefore, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Departing from the living God. I mean, it sounds serious. And it is. Talking about a heart and a life that has gone astray of the blessed promise and the calling of God for our lives. In the vain and, and the ruinous pursuits of other loves and ambitions and desires. And as a result, never coming to realize the incredible fullness of life and the purpose that comes from knowing and walking in the will and the ways of God. You see, it's actually pretty easy to tell when someone doesn't believe God. Now I know, I've heard it oftentimes. People say, well, you don't, you, you don't know my heart. Well, you know, I've also said there's a physical dimension to the spiritual part of our lives and the fact that our relationship and the things and the way we regard and respond to God will show in the way we live our lives. And so it is. Unbelievers 
people that do not believe God, they may say they do and they may go to church and they prof may profess faith in Jesus, but unbelievers tend to think, live and order their daily lives, affairs and relationships with an obvious indifference to and disregard for not only the person of God, but the gracious perfection of his purpose and calling for their lives. In other words, they're just into their own thing, okay? Choosing instead to take all matters of life on their daily, you know, all their affairs and the things they're doing. They take it all into their own hands, being wholly given over to their own perceptions, their own feelings, their own ideas, their views, their wants, and their attitudes rather than the eternally absolute and unchanging light of truth that is the Word of God. They're running their own lives instead of giving their lives over to the leading of the Holy Spirit in the light of God's Word. In fact, get a load of how Jude, verse 19, describes such individuals. It describes them, it says, these are sensual persons. In other words, they're guided more by their feelings and their sensual physical desires and passions. They're basically given over to and ruled by the sinful, selfish nature of the fallen man, the flesh. And it says, who cause divisions, strife and arguments and disputes, dysfunctional and broken relationships, all kinds of problems, including crime and wars and, man, and it's all because they tend to put themselves at the center of their lives, their circumstances and relationships, rather than God. And, and it goes on to say, having not the Spirit. Having not the Spirit. Yeah, the seal of the Holy Spirit. Which, face it, I pray isn't going to be the case when it comes to those who do have the Spirit, who indeed truly believe God through saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Romans 8 verse 9 lays it out for us this way, it says, but you are not in the spirit, I'm sorry, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. To be in the spirit means to be led by, directed by, given over to the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And it says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, because as it goes on to say, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, you're not really, truly a child of God, born of the Spirit unto God in Christ Jesus. And it's true. It's essentially unbelief. This serves as the root and cause of the eventual ruin and downfall not only of people's lives and relationships, but in fact, whole cultures, nations, and empires throughout history, really since the beginning. Pretty much just as the Word of God spells it out for us in Romans 1, verses 28 to 32, where it tells us here, it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's unbelief. They don't want to put God at the center of their thinking. They eliminate him, exclude him, disregard him, reject him. It's like, pff, who needs that stuff, man? I'm the Lord and the master of my own life. I'll do what I want, think what I want. And so, it says, God gave them over. It's like, well, that's how you respond and relate to God? God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Not fitting, speaking of things that are not right in terms of God's purpose and design for our lives. Going off to all kinds of other things. It says being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. I mean, this is always thinking up these terrible things. 
all these ideas and their schemes and their strategies and their agendas and their programs and their, I could go on and on. It says disobedient to parents, undiscerning. Can't see where the things that they are thinking of and the things they want to do are actually going to lead them. Untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. <laughs> There's a lot of that going on all around us these days. It says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, and everyone knows because God has clearly demonstrated his righteous judgment in the course of human affairs historically, that those who practice, isn't it, you know, you know, screw up once in a while, stumble and fall once in a while, but it's a way of life with these people, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, Hey, yeah, we're, we're, we're join the crowd here, man. We're going the way of the world. But it says, but also approve of those who practice them. Yeah, woke culture. Total confusion, chaos, anarchy, and lawlessness. You see it everywhere today. Putting our culture, people, and nation now in a death spiral. So I think you get the picture. Unbelief. It's that serious. And therefore, as a result, when it came to the chosen lineage of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, through whom it had been always predetermined that the seed from whom the whole new race of the redeemed unto God would come forth in the fullness of God's appointed time and way, and Jesus Christ, yes. Obviously, the thoroughly ruinous effects of unbelief would have to be restrained until that appointed time, lest the very lineage and nation out from whom the seed of God's eternal redemption and people was predestined to come forth would become thoroughly corrupted and self-destruct. Therefore, the law was handed down from God through Moses at Mount Sinai and graciously imposed upon the nation of Israel following their deliverance from Egypt. Some 435 years after his promise was given to and received through simple abiding faith on the part of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that law was given for the purpose of restraining the confusion, the chaos, the anarchy, lawlessness, and destruction that invariably results from the sin of unbelief. That You don't believe God. You don't take him at his word. And it would keep then, therefore, it would guard this chosen nation from being assimilated into a thoroughly sin-corrupted world, the very world out from which they, they had been called and set apart unto God in the first place, so as to play their appointed part in the fulfillment of his redemptive plan for all peoples. I have to think about this as, a, as one who is saved in Christ today, who having received the gospel, that it was proclaimed, that I heard it and embraced it by faith, that that gospel would never have even come to me had not the law been imposed upon Israel to restrain the effects of unbelief. They would never have survived and made it to the point where we know that in the fullness of time that Jesus Christ was brought forth of a virgin. So seriously, under the law of Moses, under the law of Moses, we talked about restraint. Listen to this. A person could be stoned to death. In fact, a person would be stoned to death for things such as sexual immorality or idolatry. These are things that characterize the peoples and nations in the world around them in their day. And even as tragically... Such things have come to define the very culture and nation in the midst of which we find ourselves today. Check it out. Galatians chapter 3 in your Bible, look at it, verses 19 through 20. It says, you read it here, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added. In other words, God imposed it upon Israel. Old Testament Israel says, because of transgressions. When you transgress, it means you step outside of, you go outside of 
the purpose and the calling of God. So it's because of that. It says that it was added. It said, tell the seed that would be Jesus should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels then. The law was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator, to, <laughs> a mediator, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Now mediator refers to one who is appointed to stand and interact with God in behalf of the people. The reason being, <laughs> well the people themselves could not interact with God because of their unbelief. And Moses, he was that mediator. And the reason God appointed Moses to serve his purpose in this capacity was the fact that Moses, along with really only two others, among the million or so of the congregation of Israel, did believe God. There's just three of them, man. Moses and then a couple other guys, Joshua and Caleb. Moses did believe God, as the other two did, whereby he could walk together in agreement with God by faith and serve God's purpose. And that's how it works. Always has, always will. Which answers the question, look at verse 21 there in your Bibles. Is the law then against the promises of God? It says, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And that's how it is. When it comes to the laws that govern the affairs of men everywhere, laws essentially protect our lives from ourselves. They don't give life, but they protect. They protect us from ourselves. Talking about the sinful, selfish nature of the fallen man, the flesh that directs, you know, your typical unbeliever to think and act with an indifference toward and a disregard for the person as well as the calling of God on our lives. And not only that, also for the good and the well-being of others because they're just pretty much thinking of themselves as they drive down the street, running red lights, going over the speed limit. <laughs> That's just an example. The thing is, however, you see, like it said, laws cannot give life. Certainly not the life that God has always purposed for us to live and enjoy with him. And so you look at the world around us today and it's like, yeah, this is definitely not what God always had in mind. So laws can't really give us that life. I'll tell you what, only God through saving faith in Jesus Christ can give that as evidenced by the spirit who lives within us. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're told that the law that God handed down to Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai with its comprehensive system of prohibitions and directives and requirements says that, that it's a good thing now. And I think you know why. It's a good thing, it said, if used according to the purpose for which God gave it. Which wasn't, I repeat, which wasn't to set some kind of standard of accomplishment that one could work to attain so as to prove themselves worthy of God's promise, as some among the churches in first century Galatia were being led to believe, but rather as... 1 Timothy 1 verses 9 through 11 states, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. <laughs> in other words, those who, you know, just think and act and conduct their lives, their affairs and relationship with a complete disregard for not only God, but the purpose, and, but it, it's, it's purpose and calling for our lives. The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, sexual immorality, uncleanness, outside of the purpose of God for our lives, for sodomites, 
for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, in other words, the word. Again, we're talking about the typical stuff. <laughs> All those things, man, they're the typical stuff that invariably rises out of a person's unbelief. Making the point, verse 22 there in your Bibles, Galatians 3, but the scripture has confined all under sin. And it's true, we've all broken the laws of God. We've all transgressed. We've all been, well, we've all blown it, okay? So there's not any way that any of us could ever hope to prove ourselves worthy of God's promise and his calling on our lives. So it says, but the scripture, the word, the law, has confined all under sin, and there's a reason for that, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given, not earned, not worked for, but the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, who turn from themselves and all else to instead focus their hearts, their lives, their faith in the realization of God's promise and calling on their lives that is now made possible through what Jesus, the seed, accomplished in our behalf. Again, through his miraculous incarnation, his sinless life, selfless suffering, atoning death, and victorious resurrection. Check it out. I'm going to read to you from Romans 8, verses 3 through 4. It tells us here, it says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, we, we in our own strength and our own efforts try as hard as we can. We could never attain to the perfection, to the righteousness of the law. Therefore, you know, the Bible refers to it then as the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, <laughs> that's all of us, God did then by sending his own son Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh as, as one of us. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh when he died and gave himself on the cross for us, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled now or realized in us who do not walk according to the flesh, that are our old way of living, but according to the Spirit. Yeah, God's Spirit, who's freely given to all true believers as God's living guarantee within us of our glorious and eternal inheritance in Christ, the moment we from our heart respond to the gospel, turning in faith from ourselves and all else to commit our lives, our hope, our focus, and our destiny in Jesus, just Jesus. Which brings us back to the nation or the lineal descendants of Israel, Old Testament Israel, which Paul really the, and the other apostles and many of the first century Christians knew as their original racial, ethnic, cultural, and religious heritage, going clear back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants upon whom the law was imposed, who for so long had been under the law, Look at verses 23 and 25 there in Galatians 3. It explains, but before faith came, faith in Christ, we were, we were kept under guard by the law. God kept Old Testament Israel. It's like he put an electric fence around them, you know. I don't know how many of them went around and touched that fence trying to, and ended up perishing because of it, but, you know, it did, it kept nation of Israel protected them from themselves until the point that Christ came. So again, it says, but before faith came, he tells us, 
Paul tells his Jewish brothers and sisters who are now Christians, he says, before that, before we came to Christ, before Jesus came and, and, and fulfilled all the requirements of the law on our behalf so that we can inherit the promises of God through faith, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Fortunately for you and I, it, it, it has now been revealed. Therefore, the law was, Paul refers to it as, he says, our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by the faith. And you know, the law still has the same effect even on all people today. You want to know if you're good enough to inherit the promises of God by yourself, in and of yourself, on the basis of your own works, your own efforts, your own merit. Well then, go to the law. Go to the Ten Commandments and then go through all of the statutes and ordinances that were prescribed in order to apply those Ten Commandments to every facet of, 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 of your life and see then if you measure up. Okay, The same law will, will invariably lead to only one conclusion for any one of us, the fact that we can't do it. Even by our best efforts, we cannot do it. So I think it does apply to us. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, be found in Christ as those who believe God Sealed now by his spirit who lives within us that we now willingly yield ourselves to. It says now we are no longer under a tutor. Don't need a tutor anymore. Man, we are now children of God. And we are now walking in with God toward the realization of his promise, his eternal purpose for our lives. And we have the Holy Spirit not only as a guarantee, not only as a witness that we are the children of God, but also as the one who will lead and work in and through us and to bring us into that. You see, here's the deal. The law did not replace faith. Okay? Faith is the way that those who have always known and loved and walked with God from the very beginning until the very end have, have, have done it. The law instead, it protected Israel in the absence of faith. In other words, their unbelief. So that many of them would one day, and Paul is one of them, and, and many of the first century Christians who were Jews, so that many of them would be justified by faith in Jesus in the fullness of God's eternally predetermined time and way. I know, God's always had a plan, man. And it's perfect. His time and his ways. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that there are many are the plans in a man's heart. But the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. And then the wonderful thing is ha having come to the place where our hearts, our trust, our faith, our lives, our hope, our destiny is focused on and grounded in and identified with Jesus in his sinless life, selfless suffering, atoning death and victorious resurrection. But well, we're no longer under the law any longer. We don't have to walk with God trying to prove ourselves. Hey, God, look at me. Hey, Lord, look at me. Hey, everybody, check me out, man. Joe Righteous here. <laughs> Boy, aren't I the anointed one? <laughs> no, that's not how it works. That's not, if you're going to truly know and love and walk with God by faith, you got to, that, that stuff, you got to scrap it, toss it in the trash, be done with it. That's the flesh, man. Crucify that flesh, reckon it is dead, and live and walk in the spirit in humility and gratitude for what it is that God has done for us and now provides for us through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus, just Jesus. Together with the rest of us as a glorious, 
blessed company of those redeemed unto God in Christ, out from among all the nations and the peoples of the earth, who through faith have all become true descendants that God promised Abraham would one day number as the stars of the heavens over 3,500 years ago. All of us, as fellow heirs with Christ, of the glorious eternal promise and the calling of God in Christ. Check it out. Verses 26 through 29 there in your Bibles. Look at there. Galat we'll finish up Galatians 3 here. It says, for you who are in Christ. For you who believe. It's evidenced by the fact you've turned from yourself and all else. To commit your heart, your hope, your faith, your, your eternal destiny to Jesus. It says... For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. I like to say here in New Mexico, there's neither Dene or Belagana. There's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, you, then you are Abraham's seed. You are the ones who have grown. We have come forth out of that seed, that life of Christ that was died and buried and then rose from the dead. And heirs now, heirs of the kingdom of God, according to to the promise God made to Abraham over 3,500 years ago. And again, it's not a destiny that any of us can work for. Instead, it's a destiny we're called to live for as heirs with Christ of the promise. And we can do this now through faith in what Jesus has accomplished in our behalf. Like Jesus said, I am the door, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Check it out. Verses 6 and 7 in chapter 4. Just go down there to the next chapter there in your Bibles. Okay? And let's read those. Man, these are glorious. It says here, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That word Abba, in case you didn't know, means daddy. Daddy, man. It's like because the spirit of God is in us, bearing witness with our hearts that we are his children in Christ. Man, now we relate to God as daddy. Which explains the fact that this calling in life as a child and therefore as an heir of God through Christ is... It is. It's a totally whole new and wonderful and fulfilling way. The only way, in fact, to truly know, love, and walk with God. That's how God has always wanted it. And you know, only Jesus. Only Jesus could have made it happen for us. So forget about trying to work for the promise. Try adhering to a rigid system of laws, requirements, and regulations. I just call it religion. Instead, simply give yourself. Just give yourself to live for the promise that God has given you as a son and a fellow heir through faith in Jesus Christ. As evidenced now by his spirit who now resides to live and to lead within you.